There are no other Everglades in the world. They are, they have always been, one of the unique regions of the Earth. Remote, never wholly known. Nothing anywhere else is like them. Those are the immortal words of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in her seminal book, The Everglades, River of Grass. Douglas was a celebrated writer, activist, and conservationist, and was one of the first people to bring attention to the natural wonders of the Everglades. The year her book was published, 1947, was the same year Everglades National Park was fully established, protecting the river of grass in perpetuity for future generations to experience and to enjoy. But Douglas's fight for the Everglades didn't end in 1947. She would continue fighting for them for the rest of her life, including establishing the Friends of the Everglades group and successfully defending them from the construction of a jet port which threatened their ecological integrity. But her most important battle was also her toughest, and it's one we're still fighting today. It involves draining the Everglades and disrupting hydrological processes that have been thousands of years in the making. Now, you might be wondering how the Everglades could be drained if they're protected as a national park. After all, national parks are supposed to preserve natural places and protect them from harm, not destroy their most prominent features. But the Everglades ecosystem is so much bigger than just Everglades National Park. It impacts to areas far beyond the park's borders have far-reaching consequences for what happens within it. This is the story of those impacts, and how ecosystem boundaries rarely fit in the predetermined political boundaries we set for them. This is the story of how the U.S. government broke the Everglades. But before we get into that, we need to understand what the Everglades are, and where they are. Everglades National Park covers a large portion of southern Florida. It's the largest subtropical wilderness in the U.S., and the third largest national park in the lower 48 states. But the Everglades ecosystem, of which Everglades National Park is only a small part, actually extends all the way up to central Florida, to the headwaters of the Kissimmee River and Lake Okeechobee. The defining characteristic of this ecosystem is what Mrs. Douglas referred to as the River of Grass, an extremely shallow and slow-moving body of water 60 miles wide and 100 miles long. And it is a river, just not in the way we typically think about them. For one, it doesn't have a defined river channel. A channel is what the river is confined to. It's essentially forming the area that the river is flowing across. It can be a few feet, or it can be a few hundred feet, but it's not typically a few miles, like in the Everglades. That's because water flows downhill, and most of the time an area's elevation forces the water to flow in a fairly well-defined area, the channel. But South Florida is flat, like really flat, and so the water spreads out far and wide across the landscape rather than collecting in a specific channel. In fact, from their highest point near Lake Okeechobee to their lowest point at Florida Bay, a distance of over 100 miles, the Everglades only lose around 12 feet of elevation. That's a slope of only 2 inches per mile. And because it's so flat, that water barely flows. It could take months or even years for water from Lake Okeechobee to fully drain into Florida Bay. This process mainly occurs in what are called sloughs, which are small channels of free-flowing water sprinkled throughout much of the Everglades' wetland vegetation. But the slow flow of water and imperceptibly small gradient is actually one of the keys to the Everglades' biodiversity. See, small changes in elevation here can actually have very large impacts on plant communities in the Everglades. And more diverse plant communities means more diverse animal communities as well, making the Everglades rich in overall biodiversity. Take, for example, pinelands. In the highest areas of the Everglades, which aren't inundated with water year-round, you can find communities dominated by pines. This ecosystem includes the South Florida slash pine and is actually maintained by fire. If you remove fire, pinelands might transition to what are called hardwood hammocks, where you can find species like oaks and copperwoods. In the wetter parts of the Everglades, cypress swamps or mangrove forests might dominate. But one of the Everglades' most important ecosystems is its sawgrass marshes. This community covers the largest amount of area in the Everglades and is dominated by sawgrass and those aforementioned sloughs. Sawgrass marshes are also the primary facilitators of the Everglades' hydrology because sawgrass likes shallow, slow-moving water, which the Everglades has a lot of. Areas where sawgrass doesn't establish end up as sloughs, and slowly but surely, water from Lake Okeechobee makes its way to Florida Bay. This sort of hydrological wonderland has a lot of benefits. In addition to providing rich habitats for plants and animals, the Everglades are a valuable source of fresh water for drinking and irrigation. They filter pollutants and improve water quality, and they help replenish underground aquifers. 
but they're also extremely fragile. And this is where our problems begin, because the hydrological system that provides all those benefits is the same hydrological system that Congress and other leaders saw as an impediment to the growth and development of South Florida. After all, you can't farm or build houses on land that's always flooded. And the Everglades are almost always flooded. And so, they set out to drain it. Now, people have been trying to farm in the Everglades since the 19th century, but have been met with little success due to the constant threat of flooding and little to no soil knowledge. Research stations would be established in the early 20th century in an attempt to understand the region's soil profile, but no amount of research could reconcile the region's constant inundation with its desire to farm. That is, until 1928, when a massive hurricane cost the lives of more than 2,000 people and exacerbated an already chronic flooding problem. The storm prompted the U.S. government to fund a series of levees along the shore of Lake Okeechobee. The levees, in many ways, did what they were supposed to. They reduced the threat of chronic flooding in the northern Everglades and allowed more development to move in. But in other ways, this marked the beginning of the end for the greater Everglades ecosystem. Because while flooding was reduced, these levees also severed the hydrological link the Everglades relied on to sustain itself. Whenever Lake Okeechobee overflowed its boundaries, this excess water is what would slowly make its way to Florida Bay. Essentially, that overflow nourishes the river of grass throughout the Everglades. With that connection severed, the river of grass began to come under threat. And that was just the beginning. In 1948, Congress passed the Flood Control Act, which authorized the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control Project. The main goal of this project was, well, flood control. In order for this area to grow, it needed to not be flooded all the time. But it also needed a steady supply of fresh water to sustain agriculture, tourism, and economic development. And so, the government created a series of agricultural and water management districts, both maintained by a system of over 1,400 miles of canals, levees, and pumping stations. Over the course of this project, over half of the Everglades were drained. The effect of this was to transform the hydrology of the Everglades from a natural process finely tuned over thousands of years to one controlled by humans. In drier times, water could be released where it was needed, and in wetter times, water could be held back to prevent flooding. Water no longer went where humans didn't want it to go, which enabled southern Florida to grow into what it is today. By 1960, the amount of developed area in southern Florida had quadrupled. Miami was growing four times as fast as the rest of the nation. The Central and Southern Florida Flood Control Project had harnessed the power of the Everglades, transforming wetland to farmland, a wild area to a man-made one. In addition to flood control, this now meant the area was finally well-suited to agriculture. The now-drained peat soil left behind proved to be rich in nutrients, and crops like sugarcane, lettuce, celery, and rice thrived. But like other parts of this project, this too had unintended consequences. See, peat soil is used to being inundated with water. Prior to flood control, this wasn't an issue. But after drainage took place, peat soils began to dry out. In the short term, this was beneficial because the soil was very nutrient-rich. But when peat soils remain dry for too long, they begin to contract, and that nutrient-rich layer of soil begins to shrink. If current agricultural practices continue, experts estimate that agriculture in the Everglades may only have decades left. And it wasn't just water quantity causing problems either. Increased agricultural runoff and urban development degraded water quality in the Everglades as well. Fertilizers and agricultural chemicals, as well as pollutants from roads, houses, and other buildings, all entered the fragile hydrological system, disrupting plant communities and poisoning wildlife. But there's also one project we haven't talked about yet, one that has an even more direct impact on Everglades National Park. In 1928, Construction was completed on U.S. Highway 41, also known as Tamiami Trail, so named because it connected Tampa with Miami. Now, Tamiami Trail was completed before many of the flood control projects we've already talked about, but its impacts have been long-lasting and continue to be seen today. Here's why the Tamiami Trail impacts are different. The flood control projects, while devastating to the Everglades, still allowed water to flow, just in a much reduced amount. Tamiami Trail, on the other hand, completely severs water flow. To construct the road, engineers essentially carved out the underlying bedrock and placed it on top of the existing soil, elevating the roadway above the existing wetlands. This effectively created a 25-mile berm restricting flow across the roadway. What made this worse was also where they constructed the road. 
Tamiami Trail cuts right through the heart of one of the main freshwater conduits in the Everglades, Shark River Slough. If you remember from earlier, sloughs are one of the main ways water flows in the Everglades. These freshwater channels cut through the sawgrass marshes and deliver fresh water out into Florida Bay. And no slough is more important in the Everglades than the Shark River Slough. It is the main conduit for fresh water flowing into Everglades National Park. By constructing a road through the slough, engineers cut off water flow directly rather than simply reduce it. And that's one thing all of these projects have in common. They all attempt to control the Everglades. The U.S. government, the state of Florida, and local leaders all saw this watery wilderness as something to be controlled, something to be exploited. The river of grass became a series of canals. The natural flow of water became a series of targeted discharges. Whether they drained it, impounded it, or sent it somewhere else, each decision had the effect of disrupting a delicate natural process. A natural process that had developed over thousands of years and gave life to an incredible abundance of plants and animals. When that process was disrupted, the Everglades changed forever. But this isn't to say that nothing has been done to try and solve these problems. Thanks to conservationists like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, we're aware of these issues, and good people are fighting to fix them. Bridges have replaced portions of the Tamiami Trail in an effort to restore natural flows. In 2000, Congress authorized the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, which recognizes the historical role of unobstructed flow in the Everglades and aims to help restore it. It's unlikely that the Everglades will return to what they once were. But with the right approach, they can come close. And an area once exploited entirely for its value to humans can begin to heal and be seen as an area valuable to all. And before you go, I want to know what you think of the issues the Everglades are facing. Do you think they can be properly restored? Can these issues be overcome? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And as always, if you want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.